Did y'all try this? All right, we still have some folks coming in, which is wonderful. Uh, we're glad to have uh, David Hunziker here with us tonight. I'll introduce him in just a minute. Uh, if you haven't, uh, we'd like to make sure you get the, the cheat sheet for the test. Um, and if you don't have a pencil, it, you're kind of out of luck. No cheating, nothing like that on anybody else's paper, but uh, Professor Hunziker is ready to, ready to school. So uh, I'll come back through here in just a second and hand, hand out some extras. I see a few folks, you can just raise your hand uh, as we go. Uh, I'm going to make a few announcements, and then Mark Johnson's going to lead us in a couple of songs. And then uh, David will uh, bring us a lesson tonight. I um, just want to remind you a couple of things. You should have gotten an email today uh, with our announcements in it. I uh, just want to remind you that uh, if you're a parent of a young child, the Children's Ministry is hosting a water day on Saturday, July 22nd. That's this Saturday from 2 to 4 at Kingwood. Um, and there's a sign up there uh, that was in the, in the email that you should have gotten. The rest of us had our water day earlier uh, today with the rain, I think. And, um, but anyway, it was, that was great to see. Um, Ann Cordell, this is not in the bulletin or in the announcements, but Ann Cordell is having her 98th birthday on Saturday. And uh, her address is in our directory app. Uh, it's, she's still at Adam's Place. I'll let you just kind of refer to that on your own, but I know she would love to get a card. Uh, that would encourage her greatly uh, as she is, is, uh, has lived a long and uh, interesting life for sure. Those of you that guys that know Ann, she's, she's a mess. So, um, Anyway, I um, want to mention that, of course, after tonight's uh, message, we'll have cookies and brownies in the fellowship hall. Appreciate you guys that have brought those. And uh, I want to congratulate and let you know about a new brother in Christ. Uh, Addison is right over here, Addison Brim. He was baptized about 5 o'clock or so this afternoon. And uh, so make sure and encourage him. We'll, uh, we'll have a prayer for him uh, here in just a second as we do that. But make sure and meet him uh, this evening. If you hadn't already, I know some, some folks have, but we're... We're excited for you, Addison, and your new walk with Christ. Um, let's, uh, let's have a prayer uh, for all these things, and I'll introduce uh, uh, David, and then I'll let Mark uh, come up and, and lead us in a few songs to get our hearts and minds prepared. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for our church family that we can gather here um, and worship you, that we can learn and apply your word. Father, just be with David as he... Uh, brings us a message as he uh, challenges our thoughts, helps us to uh, grow. And uh, Father, I know his uh, ministry is going well, and we are thankful for um, good sister churches here in Murfreesboro. We're thankful for the fellowship that exists between uh, Kingwood and North Boulevard and North Boulevard West and just all the other uh, churches in this area. We are so thankful uh, to be in a community of believers and uh, Father, be with Addison and his new walk with you. Uh, may we bless and encourage him uh, as he begins that. May we uh, be the family that he needs at this time. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Let me, uh, let me introduce uh, David. That way um, Mark can go ahead and, and lead a couple songs. Uh, David, uh, I've known him uh, probably since 2015, I guess. You had uh, David uh, came to Murfreesboro, back to Murfreesboro. Uh, to uh, teach at his alma mater. He was at Milton C. Christian School for a couple of years, 2015 to 2017. In 2017, he transitioned to uh, being on the staff at North Boulevard. He's currently uh, the minister, campus minister at North Boulevard West. They're about to open a new uh, facility, uh, Lord willing, right? Uh, things will be going well there. And um, what I would say um, about David, just knowing him as a parent of, of boys that had him, he's very passionate about the scriptures and he's passionate about people and uh, just love that to see what God's doing in your life and how he's blessing you. He's got four children, a, a wife named Kristen, uh, who is his better half. Amen. All right. That's right. And uh, they were high school sweethearts at MTCS. 
And uh, we're just thankful that David is here and look forward to, to his uh, lesson and sharing that with us. So why don't we stand, if you're able to, and let Mark uh, lead us in a few songs as we uh, prepare. <clears throat> Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The Okay, raise your hand if you need notes. I brought them because it's, it's Wednesday evening, it's midweek. You've been working hard, I know, already this week, and I'd rather you be writing or doodling than sleeping. So that's why I brought a few notes. If you need some, raise your hand, and David's handing them out in the back. Um, I am so glad to be here with you guys. I know that last week, if I'm correct, it was Chuck Mullins bringing in the dress. Am I, am I right? He's legendary here at Kingwood, Chuck Mullins. Why do I have to follow Chuck Mullins? Um, I think that's unfair. Uh, he, he has a huge impact on my life. You may or may not know, just depending on how long you've been here. My family was, were members here, and I grew up at this church. I was a young one, was in the children's ministry, and spent some time in the youth group. I was baptized here. Addison, congratulations on your baptism. Um, when I was 10 years old, sitting actually about this place in the auditorium. I was convicted by a gospel message here at Kingwood and ran down the aisle with tears in my eyes. And my dad had to chase me down the aisle and made it to the front seat. And I was greeted by a warm ministry you know, team and elders. And uh, Dan Hibden was one of the elders and he signed my baptism certificate. I'm now in ministry with him now. And, but anyway, I raced down there and my parents told me later what I said on the front row. As a 10-year-old, I, I didn't remember much of what I said, but they told me later that I looked at my dad in the eye and I said, Dad, I need you to baptize me today. 
I'm sitting in the garbage can of sin, is what I told him I was experiencing. <laughs> and I don't know what a 10-year-old was doing to be in the garbage can of sin, but I did know I needed Jesus, and King Wood helped bring me to Jesus. And I'm thankful for you, and uh, the, the place looks great. I just walked in. It just feels so warm and friendly and welcoming, and, and you all certainly are, so, so thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit tonight about this battle that we're in that we might just refer to as the unseen battle. The unseen battle. We share a common enemy. And uh, I was encouraged because I'm sitting here singing and I see, and let me try to do it from memory, care, share, prepare, declare behind me. Is that right? That's a fantastic way to approach what Jesus has entrusted to us. But you have an enemy. So there's nothing about that that's going to be easy. I see life on the vine right? And, that, and we're working through how to live on the vine and bear fruit and be attached to Jesus. But you have an enemy who makes that very difficult, who makes it discouraging at times. You get distracted at times. We find ourselves in despair at times. And I want to talk a little bit about how to fight this unseen battle, how to overcome the schemes of our great enemy that we share, that we're constantly against. It's a daily battle. And I want to just start by going back in time to 2001, uh, September 11, 2001. I was here at Kingwood, actually, uh, during that time, a student at Middle Tennessee Christian School. And God bless him, Whit Mitchell was my sixth grade teacher, and he rolled in an old-fashioned TV cart with the VCR player and all that strapped to the cart. And he rolled it into our classroom that day, and he turned it on so that we as American citizens, although we were young, could witness these images. A horrific image. I'm not going to show the most graphic images of this day, don't worry. But these are just horrific images. It was 8.45 a.m., a clear Tuesday morning, when a Boeing 767 with 20,000 gallons of jet fuel flew into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. 18 minutes later, a Boeing 767, again, 20,000 gallons of jet fuel, flew into the South Tower. And it was that second one when we realized, and it's pictured here, when we realized we were under attack. And we bring in the TV cart, and I'm sitting with the classmates of you know, sixth grade, and we have to realize for the first time in our lives that we have an enemy, and we're under attack. Later that day, the Pentagon was struck. Possibly the capital was going to be, but the heroics of United 93, the passengers on United 93, they downed the plane in the field in Pennsylvania. And then we just kind of reflect back on the day when first responders would have stood and looked at this scene. What do you do? And you wonder where to even begin and how to try to begin a search for bodies and how to recover anything and, any, and anyone you possibly can recover. We, we became familiar with this as ground zero. And ground zero is etched in many of our memories because it's a place of devastation unlike anything we'd ever seen before. And then the conversations began. Why were we not aware? Who did this? And why did they do it? And then the biggest question we were asking, and as we flew our American flags and we united in grief, we all asked this question, how are we going to prevent this from happening again? And that was what we wanted to know. And in 68 days, we got our answer. But let me just have you write these things down if you'd like to, to write some notes. It was September 11, 2001, when we realized that someone in a foreign land was scheming against us. It's an unsettling reality. No one wants to think about it. We would argue until we're blue in the face that there should be anybody scheming against America, but someone in a foreign land was scheming against us. And so we had to learn language. We learned about Al-Qaeda. I had never heard that, Al-Qaeda, before. We learned about characters like Osama bin Laden. I'd never had to hear that name before. But we learned about these characters in a foreign land who were scheming against us. And we asked the question, how will we prevent this from happening again? And 68 days later, the TSA was created so that we would never again be caught unaware. That's our, that was our answer. Department of Homeland Security, and by extension, the TSA, so that we would never again be caught unaware. And so here now, when you travel, you face these guys, don't you? It's a little slower to try to get on a plane. 
Uh, if you're like me, you, you have to Google the night before, what can I have, how, you know, how much liquids can I bring in a carry-on, and, and, and how much is too much, and so on. You need to check your bags. And I'm just really impressed, especially of these three. You look at that, that lady standing there. She was born ready to check your bags, wasn't she? I mean, there's just, there's some vigilance that takes place at every security checkpoint when you're trying to get on a plane. And this lady has it etched in her mind that in September 11, 2001, the planes were hijacked because they were unsecurely monitored. And it's her responsibility to not let any funny business happen on a plane. So she stands guard. He stands guard with this story etched in their minds that it's her responsibility not to let anything like that happen again. And in physical war, we know the great importance of intelligence, of vigilance, of doing our homework. But we get lax in spiritual war. And we forget every day we have an enemy who's trying to slide things past us and thwart every plan and destroy our lives and destroy our marriages and destroy our churches and destroy the future of this great country and just work against us in everything we're trying to do. If you recognize that, can somebody give an amen that they've seen him at work in our midst? Yes. And we need to be as vigilant as the TSA. And to, so tonight, what I'm going to do is just bring before you how we can fight the unseen battle and be as vigilant as they have been in their guard of our great country. And so one thing we need to do, I just want to hit a few scriptures with you. Can you turn to Ephesians chapter 6 in your Bibles? And Ephesians chapter 6 is the great text on spiritual battle that we're in you hear Paul as he as he says these words finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes there is a defensive posture in spiritual battle it's not the only posture that we have care share prepare declare is like offensive there's good work for us to do but there is also a defensive posture that we have to have to take our stand against the devil's schemes. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, we hear more about the devil's schemes. And this is what Paul says. He says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Now that, let me make sure you guys can still hear me. Is this on? Okay. That verse picks up in the middle of a thought. So I want to expound for just a minute. Most likely what's happening in this verse is that the Corinthian church is continuing to work out a problem that they've been working out for a while. In 1 Corinthians, we find out that a man has done an egregious thing and has had sexual relations with his father's wife. So the church is working out this massive problem. They get Paul involved to try to work out the problem. And by the second letter to the Corinthians, they've made a lot of headway. The man has repented and they're trying to figure out how to restore him and get to the bottom of this. And it's in that context that Paul writes, we must not be unaware of Satan's schemes. Here's his point. It's never just us working out a problem. It's never just us working out a problem. Satan is always scheming against us as we work out our problems. Always. In the church, he's always working against us as we work to our problems. And that's true at home too. Have you ever been in an argument with your spouse? Of course not. Yes, good job shaking your head no. I saw a few men do that. Imagining hypothetically that you end up in a situation like that. It's never just you and your spouse, is it? It's never just you and your spouse. There are spiritual realities that work against us and Satan would love to come between you and your spouse. You ever tried to work out an issue with your children? It's never just you and your children. Satan would love to come between you and your kids. And, and Paul uses this word awareness. We, we must not be unaware of his schemes. Uh, the schemes of Satan are about bringing you to ground zero, about bringing the kind of destruction that we saw on September 11. I think Peter makes it clear. You are to be alert of sober mind your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's the story you're supposed to have in your mind so that you'll stand guard with the same kind of vigilance as these 
TSA officers. And here's just one key point to know, and this is what I want to talk about. Awareness is key for spiritual victory. It's awareness that's been brought up multiple times in these texts by Paul and by Peter. That's why Peter says you have to be alert. You need to be sober-minded. Because if you're ever caught unaware, he will take advantage. Awareness is key for spiritual victory. And let me just talk to you a little bit about, about why you are such a target. I know Kingwood. I grew up here. You brought me to Jesus. If you guys weren't such friends of God, you wouldn't be such enemies of Satan. But you are friends of God. That's not my quote. If God were not your friend, Satan wouldn't be so much your enemy. But I know you. And I know God's your friend. And therefore, automatically, you've set yourself up with an enemy, Satan. Addison, this is pretty encouraging, isn't it, to start a spiritual journey? Yeah, I mean, you got an enemy now, right? And this enemy is going to be looking to deceive, discourage, bring despair. Let's, uh, let's talk about his schemes and how to overcome them. The way I want to approach his schemes and how to overcome his schemes, I'm going to take you back to a sermon by George Whitfield in 1739, great revivalist preacher. He, he preaches at St. Helens, and he preaches a sermon called Satan's Devices. I want, to, I want to talk about his outline for a minute, and I'll tell you why. Because Satan's schemes in 1739 are the same as they are in 2023. And they're the same as they're going to be in 2033 and 2000, or 3023. So you can begin to prepare your grandchildren. You can prepare you know, future legacy in your family for how to handle Satan's schemes. Because he's not changing. It's all the same. Now, Whitfield is a Calvinist. I am not. Okay? I'm not trying to become... Whitfield, but I want to show you how Satan has worked the same for quite some time. Let me just work you through a few of what he says. But now, before I do so, C.S. Lewis gives really good advice here on how to approach this battle with Satan. He says, you got to avoid two ditches. The first ditch you have to avoid when speaking of Satan, when speaking of anything in this kind of realm, is the ditch of disbelief. That's the first ditch we have to be mindful to avoid. C.S. Lewis says, especially among Americans, that there's a tendency just to disbelieve that Satan is up to no good in your life. But you guys have walked with Jesus, many of you, for quite some time. And I believe you know that you have an enemy who's working against you. So I hope you're not finding yourself in a disbelief that Satan is active in the world today. He's certainly active in the world today. The other ditch to uh, be careful about is this ditch of excessive interest. And there are people who are falling into that in our land. Excessive interest with the demonic realm. Excessive interest with Satan himself. I don't want to bring this information before you because it sickens me, but Bible burnings and deconversion ceremonies and Satan worship, that's not on the decline. It's on the rise in our country because there is excessive interest in these dark powers of Satan. Obviously, that's not for the church. Obviously, we preach against it. Clearly, we stand for something above that. Our road that we walk is this road of awareness, not disbelief, not excessive interest, but awareness of what the enemy is trying to accomplish. You see the fruits of his work in our land. You see the fruits of his work even in trying to discourage the church. You know, we're close to, God willing, opening up a new beautiful building for worship and for preaching. August 5th is our grand opening weekend, if God wills it. I hope he does. Uh, we got to stripe a parking lot and assemble some furniture. and hope it, I hope it happens. But I'm telling you, I have traveled to multiple countries where it's just far more fruitful for making disciples and growing churches than the hard soil that is America. We are a hard soil. And Satan has been active and unchecked for a long time here. And it's created just an uphill battle for the church right now. Um, I don't want you to be discouraged about it, but I'm raising awareness again. Awareness is key for spiritual victory. Here's what Whitfield lays out. So let me just give you the six schemes of Satan. Sorry, that's small font, but here, here they are. Okay, number one, Satan is active in driving us to despair. A few notes on each of these. All right, I'll move quickly through them. He's active in driving people to despair. 
In June of 2018, I wonder if you were one of the many who was just mind blown at an article written by the CDC of June in 2018. They wrote an article, I published it called The U.S. Rise in Suicide Rates from 1999 to 2016. Nationwide, we've seen a 34% increase in suicide rates from 1999 to 2016. If I could emotionally bear it, I would say raise your hand if you or somebody you love has been affected by suicide, but I couldn't emotionally bear to see it. It's just on the rise. And Satan is driving people to a place of despair. Really at historic rates in this country. And what I want to mention to you is that God, who is the God of hope, we pray fills you with joy and peace as you trust in him. Paul says that you are to overflow with hope. That those of you who are connected to God are to, like him, be marked by, by hope. People of joy and people of hope. That's why despair is not just an emotional problem. Despair is a spiritual problem. If God is the God of hope, and we know he is, then despair is how you are knocked out of alignment with God. You hear that? God is the God of hope. Despair is how some, some people are first knocked out of alignment with God because he is the God of all hope. So Soren Kierkegaard was the one who championed that idea, and I believe it. If you are aligned with God, you are overflowing with hope. If Satan has worked to bring you to a place of despair, you lose alignment, which means you can no longer hear his call for your life. You can no longer uh, understand the scriptures. You can no longer enjoy Christian fellowship. You no longer see your place in the church. You no longer crave Jesus because despair has sunk so low. When he talks about despair in his sermon in 1739, George Whitfield preaches to the crowd and he says, there are some of you here who believe you are too vile of a sinner to be loved by God. And that that's how Satan is working to bring you to despair. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I have. And I know many my age, excuse me, who have experienced it. You know, I'm just too vile a sinner for God to love me and to forgive me. In 2017, I actually began to personally feel that message. And I was baptized here, been loved by the church, believe God loves me. But Satan got a foothold and was convincing me I was probably too vile to be loved, truly loved and forgiven by God. My wife did a beautiful thing for me. She called this church. She called the front office, the staff. I, somebody answered the phone, and my wife said, is there any way I could get into the building with my husband? The lady said, sure, we'll work it out. We'll figure out a time and help you get in. And sure enough, they welcomed some, probably one of you, I don't know, welcomed us in, very loving. My wife says, I just would like a few minutes with my husband in the auditorium, and we probably will need to use the, the baptistry space if that's okay. Sure, it's okay. And they let us in, and we walked up. And I, she took me up here. I, I just sat and put my feet in the waters here. I wasn't rebaptized, but I just sat, and I remembered that at 10 years old, Jesus called my name. He forgave me. He told me he loved me. And he welcomed me into this church family. And I needed to remember it to overcome the despair that I was experiencing. And, and some of you need to be active in fighting despair as it's coming into your life. It might not be that despair, that you're too vile a sinner. It might be something else. It might just be the despair you feel about the direction of your country. It might be the despair you feel about another family member. I don't know. But what I know is that despair knocks you out of alignment with God and that you have to be active in fighting despair. The second thing Whitfield mentions is that he tempts us to be proud. Oh, we know this. Why does he tempt us to be proud? Remember, Satan is trying to destroy you. The fastest way from where you are to your total destruction, the fastest way is pride. The scriptures are very clear on it. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Some of you are history buffs in the room, and if you're a history buff, you know that you can take any national tragedy, you can take destruction anywhere in history, 
And you can start at the point of destruction, and you can work your way back, and you'll find a thread of pride somewhere in the historical story. Take this one, for instance, January 28, 1986. Challenger, right? And as I'm putting up this picture, I'm reminded that this is now the second of two national tragedies that I've mentioned tonight. Excuse me for that. I will not talk about Pearl Harbor or anything else, all right? January 28, 1986, a seven-passenger crew gets into this uh, rocket Challenger. Krista McAuliffe is probably the most beloved because she's a teacher and you know she represents all of the young Americans who are watching this beloved teacher load up to Challenger and it's a tragic 78 second flight before it explodes. Fascinating the story. Alan McDonald tells the story. He's one of the key engineers of Challenger. And the way he tells the story, he says that there were key signatures needed on that morning to sign off on the launching of this rocket. And one key signature was not granted, it was his. As one of the engineers, he had great concerns that the freezing temperatures had compromised the integrity of the O-rings on the rocket. And he wouldn't sign off on the launch of the ship. So he was superseded by a supervisor who signed off. And despite all of his warnings, they launched a 78-second tragic flight. When Alan writes on it, he writes extensively on this in one of his books. When he writes on it, he uses this word, so I'm not putting a word in his mouth. He said it was arrogance. It was arrogance that led to the destruction of this rocket ship. Arrogance precedes destruction in all of our lives. It's a biblical theme. It's a national theme. Arrogance precedes destruction. Just take, for instance, the story of David. It was arrogance that led him to to take a census of his people. It's pride. And the biblical language here is very fascinating. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census. Or if you like other versions, it says he provoked David to number Israel. That's the King James. Or Satan moved him to number Israel. Or I like the CEV here. Satan made David think it was a good idea to take a census of Israel. What is happening here? Satan does not plant a seed of pride in David. Satan finds it and he waters it and he waters it and he brings fruit out of it. You can only imagine that he gives David the thought, all the other kings take census. You need to know how many people are under you. How can you exalt your name as a king if you don't do this? So David does. And what takes place in the scene is the kind of classic cartoon thing that we do with Satan. David is hearing a voice in his ear that he doesn't typically follow. But when he chose to follow it, it led to destruction. And then at least the one redemptive part of the story is that when it's all said and done and truly destruction has now taken place after God's punishment of the people, David repents and he says, I, I the shepherd have sinned and done wrong. He doesn't say the devil made me do it. Why does he not say that? Well, Satan incited him and moved him. Satan worked on the pride in his heart, but David did it. And that's why we then, in recounting all of our own mistakes, have to say, I did it. I did it. I did it. But we need to be increasingly aware that Satan moves to bring pride into our lives. That's why we have to stay aware. Third, Whitfield mentions, he tempts us to doubt God when our prayers seem to go unanswered. Uh, June 7, I think, was actually the day I was supposed to be here with you. It was rescheduled. I was in the critical care unit on that day. We were praying My small group gathered with a 26-year-old young man, praying that God would spare his life. He had suddenly experienced kidney failure that led to to every organ eventually failing in his body. Reasons unknown, very sudden, went in on a Monday, and by Wednesday was on death's bed. We're praying for his life to be spared. So here is what we desire. A couple hours pass, we're praying, and under passes. So here's what actually happened. Something different. And it's this gap that Satan likes to work in. 
you have hopes and prayers and you bring them before God with faith, with an honest heart, and then maybe this something else becomes the reality and there's a gap and this gap leaves space and Satan likes to fill that space. Either God isn't good, there's not a God, or you're not good. If you were good, maybe it would have been answered. Or if he was good, certainly he would, he would have done it. He likes to fill that space. The first time I ever experienced that space, I was a member here at Kingwood. I was 10 years old. I visited frequently McMinnville, Tennessee, this house on Pepper Branch. It's a small house. 79 Pepper Branch Road in McMinnville, Tennessee. My, my granny and my papa lived here. And um, on one afternoon, I'm playing Nerf ball with my granny because she was a very cool granny. We would wade in the creek, we'd play fetch with the dog, and we'd throw Nerf ball. And my older brother threw a Nerf ball to granny, and it went too high. She couldn't catch it. It hit right here on her hairline, and it knocked her hair right off of her head. I'm a 10-year-old boy. I'm screaming. I scream at my brother, you broke granny. I had no idea that her hair could just fall right off of her head. So we find out she has ovarian cancer. We begin to pray, me and my young brothers, the first really earnest, fervent prayer of my young life. God, heal granny, save granny. 90 days of that. She had been battling it for several years, and we didn't know. She'd still wait in the creek. She still played fetch. She's taught me how to cross stitch, and she'd still sip sun drop every time we'd go and visit. I had no idea she had cancer. We prayed and we prayed. 90 days later, I was laying a rose on her burial site. What happened? Satan loves to fill that gap. Why didn't it? Why wasn't she healed? Why was my prayer not heard or not answered the way I had hoped? So this gap right here is very, very difficult for people to navigate. And I am very thankful for scriptures that help us navigate this gap. Here's the best of them. Three times, Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away. We don't know what it is. Some ailment, some thorn in his flesh, some problem. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This is a beautiful scripture because Paul had the gap. I'm praying it's to be taken away. It's not taken away. Satan would love to work in that gap. Either, Paul, your prayers in Christ's name are not effective. Maybe Jesus isn't the Messiah. Maybe God's not who you think he is. Maybe you're not good. And instead of letting Satan work in that gap, he, Paul, with very sound theology, fills the gap for us. God's grace is sufficient, and his power is made perfect in our weakness. This idea that then I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me, that's the posture we need to take in the gap. God, I know you're good. I don't doubt that you're good. I know, God, that you are powerful. I don't doubt that you're powerful. I know you hear me. I don't doubt that you hear me. If you then, God, will take this weakness, I will even boast in it if it will bring you more glory. If this can be a testimony, I will use it as such, as such a testimony. Uh, I, I just need you to know that it was prayers that led Israel to be released from bondage. He says, I hear the cries of my people. It was prayers that released Peter from prison. It was prayers that had Samuel born, the prayers of Hannah, a barren mother. Prayer was why John was born to the aged Elizabeth. Prayer was why 185,000 Assyrians were defeated by a far lesser army. Prayer are how demons were driven out. Prayer is how the Spirit was poured out. God responds to prayer. We know this. Satan would have you believe otherwise. In that gap that Paul fills for us when he says God's grace is sufficient, my power is made perfect in weakness. Number four, he troubles the believer with blasphemous, unbelieving, impure thoughts. Blasphemous, unbelieving, impure thoughts. I emphasize thoughts because the battleground that Satan works on primarily is the battleground of the mind. The battleground of the mind. 
how he would like to influence your thoughts. Have you ever had a thought and you wondered, I don't know where that came from? Maybe it was a thought that was an unfiltered comment. You said, I don't know where that came from. I certainly didn't even mean to say that. I believe that there are some things you can control and others you can't. This TSA officer cannot control if somebody tries some funny business and brings a bag to them that either has too much liquid, a weapon, something that doesn't need to board the plane. That TSA officer cannot control that. But what can the TSA officer control? The TSA officer is responsible for scanning the bag, checking the bag, emptying the bag of anything that it must be emptied of before it's loaded on the plane. So are you. There are, there are certain thoughts that will come at you like a fiery dart. You, however, are responsible for scanning those thoughts, unpacking them, and making sure that only the safe stuff boards the plane. This is why the scriptures say that you're supposed to take every thought captive. Every thought captive and submit it to obedience to Jesus Christ. The battleground is the battleground of the mind. And I believe that. Number five, he tempts us by carnal friends and relatives. What we learn here is that Satan does not abide by any rules of war. He doesn't abide by any rules of war. He uses sometimes the closest people to us to send us the most devastating messages. You ever thought about this? Job's wife came to him and said, curse God and die. His wife, his journey partner, his love, when he is confidant, when he trusted, came to him in his time of despair and said, you need to curse God and die. He had learned to trust the voice of his wife. Satan abides by no rules of warfare. Jesus, it was his best friend Peter, his closest confidant Peter, to whom he would eventually entrust the Jerusalem church, Peter, who said, you ought not go to that cross. And so he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God. Your closest friends and family members will at times need you to say, I reject that statement. I reject this new way that you're thinking about Paul. I reject your, your new way of thinking about sin. I reject this new ideology you're trying to bring into my life. I reject this way you're trying to think about God or about Jesus that contradicts the scriptures. Your closest friends and family. This is because Satan knows many of you will not trust his voice, but you will trust the voice of someone that you love, and so we'll use that voice, telling you very real, this is a very rea uh, real reality. It's the, it's the ride alone with the 20-year-old son, and you love and trust your 20-year-old son, but he is at a faith crisis, and he starts speaking about the scripture in compromising ways, and Satan begins working on your mind. How difficult is it to say to somebody you love and trust, no, I disagree with you on this. I disagree with you on this. And I've got to be mindful that, that I have to stand firm on the things of God. Number six, sometimes he doesn't tempt you to surprise you when you least expect it. This is true because Jesus experienced it. He eventually stopped tempting Jesus in the wilderness to wait for an opportune time. You know what an opportune time is for Satan to attack? When you start scrolling on a device with no thought of Satan as your enemy, that's an opportune time. When you start talking to your spouse just based on the way you feel and think without any thought of Satan as your enemy, that's an opportune time. When you wake up to go face a day at work and things are already kind of tense at work, and you have no thought of Satan as your enemy. That's an opportune time for rage at work, for divisiveness at work. He's waiting for opportune times. This is why awareness is key for spiritual victory. Whitfield says this as he kind of wraps up his sermon. Oh, Christian, carefully watch over your heart. And whenever you perceive yourself to be falling into a spiritual slumber, say to it as Christ said to his disciples, why are you sleeping? 
Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Awake, awake, put on strength, watch and pray. And this life, is this life a time to lie down and slumber? Wake up and call upon your God. Your spiritual enemy is not dead, but lurks in some secret place seeking a convenient opportunity how he might betray you. If you don't think it's important to guard yourself against the devil, then you will cease being a friend of God. You will cease to walk down that narrow road that leads to eternal life. Wow, that's so true. That is so true. We share a common enemy. So how do we increase our awareness? I just just want to let you know that Satan has a vision for your life, and this is his vision for your life. If you're going places, Satan wants to bring you down here. If you are having an impact for Christ in the world, Satan wants to bring you to this place of destruction. I believe that. Here are a few things increasingly more difficult for you to do but I believe are super important for you to fight back and to overcome the schemes of the enemy. Here's the first one. Pray that God might reveal Satan's schemes in your life. Let me tell you why I say that. The TSA officer has a scanning device knowing that their eyes can't see everything that comes to them. God is your eye in your spiritual battle. You want to pray, Lord, please show me things I'm currently overlooking. Be my eyes. And show me anything I'm currently overlooking. The second, again, a bit more vulnerable every time we go forward here. Share whatever comes out of that with a small group of people. If I'm your enemy and I'm not, the way I would believe I could take you out the fastest is by isolating you. I would have you fight alone. But when you come up upon a discovery of either one of these six schemes or something else that you know he's doing in your life, Share it with a small group of people as quickly as possible so that you don't fight alone. Number three, be vigilant. Red flag every scheme of Satan in your life. The people who I know who daily overcome the schemes of Satan keep some form of journal. It doesn't have to be a formal journal. Some way of taking record. Here's how he's attacking me and here's how I'm going to fight back. So I do strongly encourage a spiritual journal of some sort. And then number four, maybe the hardest of all, identify the lie and whatever attack he's bringing to you and replace it with the truth. And that way you actively build your life on truth instead of deceit. The lie in 2017 that led me back here was that I was too vile for God to love me and to forgive me. My wife came alongside me to help me replace it with the truth that Jesus died for me, that he loves me, that he welcomes me in like a prodigal, but he welcomes me in and he gives me a place. That's the truth I have to build my life on. We ought to be identifying, flagging every lie and replacing it with the truth. Let me tell you, um, you guys are very aware of the political season that's upon us. (laughs) Very aware of the way that, uh, how could we, we can just outright say it, Satan has been active in the next generation coming up into this great country and working deceit, working to sow seeds, lies about the church, about the scriptures, about Jesus. He, he's our common enemy. He's our common enemy. And there's really no more important work than undoing the deeds of Satan. Say, Jesus outright came to undo the deeds of darkness and to overcome the schemes of Satan. And it is a high honor to partner with you in this work, to partner with you in this, to beat him at his own game. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is the God of peace who's with us. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. The church says, amen. Amen. I am going to pray for you. I know I'm turning it over to David, um, but I want to pray too. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity, God, just to expose, expose the deeds of darkness, expose Satan at his work. We pray for faith and increasing faith to overcome. We pray, God, that as uh, churches united, We wouldn't give him a place in our midst. He wouldn't outwit us, but that, Father, we would be vigilant to uncover his deeds among us and to overcome them. I thank you for King Wood.
Thank you for the history of this church. Thank you for the family that they are to many and how they bring people to Christ. And I pray you continue that legacy for many, many years. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, David, over to you. Join me in thanking uh, David for his uh, good words tonight. Amen to that. Thank you for the, the challenge. Uh, stick around and enjoy uh, some dessert at the Fellowship Hall. Uh, Glenn Garner and others, I know some of you have prepared things um, for us to enjoy. And it's not just for us to, to feed our bellies. It's for us to stick around in fellowship and, and encourage each other and connect. So spend a few extra minutes uh, doing that. And uh, let's stand and uh, we'll be dismissed with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this night. We thank you for an opportunity to, um, to glean something about the battle that is all around us that we're in every day. The good reminders that David gave us from scripture uh, help us to take one thing from that and apply it to our lives. Father, bless our children, bless our teens, bless our families from young to old. Mr. Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Have a good evening.